Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about my short story collection. <laughs> One of my previous older videos, I talked about the first four short stories. So today I'm going to continue. Okay, so first up, the summer of 99. The summer of 99 is filled with nostalgia. Um, it it's about a girl, you know, who spends the summer with her cousins in Tepeleni and I drew so many scenes in this uh, story I drew from my memories of my own childhood when we would go visit my grandpa in Tepeleni the house my grandpa used to live in and the river next to, right outside of um, the town um, everything is in here, of course, this is a made-up story, but um, there are so many real places in this story and I just loved it and every time I read it and every time I, I tried to edit it, I just wanted to cry, you know, remembering my childhood. Okay, up next. Uh, Manananggal. Manananggal is the August story. Another one of those that I drew from memories, places that came, you know, um, that places that made it into the story that are actual real places. Um, this story is written in a series of emails. So we have the protagonist, uh, Georgia, who's traveling to the Philippines for research. Sounds eerily familiar, but <laughs> moving on. So she's uh, sending emails to her fiancé every day, explaining to him, you know, what's going on. And it gets progressively creepy. And that's exactly where the similarities stop. In case you don't know, uh, I've been to the Philippines for research. Um, so I made my protagonist go to the places that I went because those were like the exact places I knew to describe from memory without having to research because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> I tried to focus my entire research on the legend of the Manananggal. So I wrote about a fictional uh, person traveling in real places being like followed by this Manananggal creature. So the Manananggal I I don't know if I want to get into detail, so it's like a creature, it's like an evil creature that preys on pregnant women and uh, they tend to, it's usually I think female, and they usually like cut their torso, they cut their body in half and they hide their legs in the woods while the upper body, you know, develops wings and they fly around looking for their next meal, you know, like that's the simplest way I could describe it. So, yeah, our protagonist happens to see Amanangal and everything, like, is bad. <laughs> so that's what happens and everything is described through a series of emails. What's next? What's next? September. Fresh Paint. Fresh Paint is a very short story that was published back in 2020, in April 2020, by Literally Stories. Um, it follows the thoughts of a serial killer, and I think that's where I'm going to stop. <laughs> she's on a date with her new victim, and like she's thinking of what's going on and what's going to happen later, so you can read the story online for free but I just wanted to include it in my collection because I wanted to have it also, you know, in a printed form. So yeah, Fresh Paint is coming to life again. Next up we have It Was Thirsty for Blood. Um, hmm. So this story was kind of... Um, weird for me to write. I mean, it was kind of difficult and a little bit, you know, overwhelming. I don't know what went wrong with the story. I just couldn't, like, get myself to form 
the actual words. I had the entire story in my mind and I had to write this story like I think like six times to get it to the place the the final manuscript that it is today, the final story. Um, even though nothing changed in the storyline, I just didn't know how to portray it, how to describe the story, how to tell the story. So this is an interrogation. The entire story is an interrogation. We have the protagonist, Maria, who is um, sorry, I'm, try I'm also trying to remember. <laughs> okay, yeah, so there's this protagonist, Maria, uh, a psychiatrist inside the interrogation room, and two officers. So what's happening is that she's going through some evaluation by the psychiatrist. Fun fact, uh, this psychiatrist is the same psychiatrist that appears in The Shadows We Live In, um, in the last chapter, just so you know. Um, okay, so um, Maria is actually trying to describe, I'm trying not to spoil anything, it's why I'm looking at my manuscript because, okay, so this is like third paragraph, you have to hear the entire story to understand why I killed her. Okay, so it's right from the beginning we know that she's killed someone and that's what she's there to talk about. Ah, oh, okay, no spoilers. <laughs> Finally, moving on to November, Corinna's ballet class. Corinna's ballet class was also a story that was published uh, previously. It was actually published earlier this year, in 2024, um, in Reedsy. I had submitted this story to a writing contest. Um, there was a writing prompt that I thought, you know, was exactly what the story was about inside my head. And that's how I sent it back this year in April. And although I didn't win the contest, it is online. You can find it for free. But again, I want I want all my stories eventually to be in a collection, all the short stories. So what's this about? <laughs> Corinna's ballet class is literally about Corinna's ballet class. It's a ballet class that never ends. It's a loop. She's like so exhausted, so tired, thinking that this class is, has been going on forever. And then she leaves and, you know, she opens the door and she enters again the class. So that's what's happening over and over. But each, you know, each lesson becomes a little bit more creepy and more eerie. She's getting exhausted. She doesn't understand why she's doing things wrong. Her ankle is hurting and it's throbbing. And then in the next, it's like uh, bluish. And then, you know, eventually she breaks her leg, you know, as she dances. And everything is so weird, you know, like she's looking at herself in the mirror and everybody's watching her, like how great she is. And then, in the next and the following lessons, nobody's watching her but the teacher and and herself, you know, and then eventually she's the only one watching her through the mirror, like her reflection is the only one looking at her as she dances. And then, you know, by the end, even her reflection is gone and there's nobody there when she does, you know, something impossible, something that can't be done. Um, nobody's there to see her and she starts to wonder, you know, why is everything so wrong? <laughs> and she starts to wonder why, why she's like that, <laughs> okay? Um, no, basically, um, it's, you know, a metaphor. It's a metaphor for burnout and mental health. You know, the way you know you're in pain, you hurt, you can't go on, but you still push yourself because you feel like if you could just push yourself just a tiny bit more, you might be able to, I don't know, do stuff and get rid of your burnout, but you know, that never happens. And she continues to smile because she's a ballerina, you know, and if you've ever done ballet or any type of, any form of dancing, you know how important your facial expression is when you dance. 
and even though your your whole body aches, you know, when you're uh, dancing ballet especially, uh, you still have to smile at your audience and she's in pain, and she's smiling and I feel like that was the perfect simile to, you know, burn out in real life, like you hurt you feel numb or you hurt or you feel numb or whatever but you don't tell anybody you don't show it outwards you continue your day smiling and being you know a functional human being okay that's enough so i'm going to stop part two here and i'm going to film part three right now but i'm going to make a different video for that so it doesn't get too long um so yeah that's it for today i'll see you next week with part three